track. Um, this morning we're going to start off a talk uh, with Mike Spaba, who's going to talk to us about teaching closure. Mike is the CEO of Active Group. Um, he's also one of the co-organizers of the great Bob Conf, which happened yesterday. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that saves me two slides. Great. Um, anyway, so... Um, so I've been teaching programming for a long time. Um, and I just realized, I think this is the 30th anniversary of me teaching programming to other people. So I started, um, I started teaching, so, so officially teaching. So I taught uh, an, actually an official course, AP Computer Science at high school level in 1987 and 88. Um, I, d I taught programming at the university level for about, well, for more than 10 years, I guess, I, I developed a curriculum that is still in use at the University of Tübingen uh, and actually at one or two other schools. Uh, I taught humanities majors. Um, I've done professional training for, for active group. Um, I've, I've taught informally to many other people, to, uh, to friends who didn't know what they were getting into. Of course, my, my kids suffer, uh, co-workers, all of that. So when you, when you're, um, when you're into programming and you like programming, you think it, you know, it, it's something that you need to teach to other people. And so, um, no, you don't. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so, so you get this idea, and, and, and usually when you teach enough people, you'll, you, you'll usually find a few Sheldons, right? And they just love everything that you throw at them. And it takes many years to figure out that it doesn't really matter what you throw at them. They will just eat it up whatever it is, right? Uh, so Sheldon's, they love the Lambda calculus, they, but they also love assembly code, and they love whatever, Pascal programming, and they love Java programming. Um, but if you do that at scale, if you teach many, many people, uh, and, you know, there's usually enough Sheldon's to keep you going, to give you enough positive feedback to make you feel good. But once you look out the rear view window, you sometimes discover that the view is something like that, that you leave many people behind. Uh, who you always think, you know, were just like the Sheldons, um, and so they must have eaten up everything that you taught them as well, but somehow they didn't. And sometimes that's a little hard to discover. Those people don't come up to you and say, well, that was a little hard to understand. Um, sometimes, you know, when you do that at the university or school level, you notice in the final exams, and by that time, these people are gone. And so, um, you know, since we love programming, we, we make this assumption that our students, you know, they're all like us. And so, surely, they must learn like us. And so, so if we just think of a way that seems okay uh, for us, to, how we learn how to program, that doesn't necessarily mean, you, you don't know who that person is, right? On the, well, imagine it's that person, okay? <laughs> um, so, anyway, there you go. Fix that for you. So, in particular, you all here because you love closure, right? And I think so there's this implicit assumption that because you love programming and closure, you know, um, that, is, that must be the thing that you teach to other people. And I want to share some unpleasant news with you that maybe that isn't the best idea. So in particular, um, there's a wonderful initiative that you all know, Closure Bridge, um, and, um, which, which I support in, in more ways than you know. I'm not here to talk about that. But um, if you look at their homepage, it says, closure is great for beginners. Um, and, and then there's some reasoning on why closure must be great for beginners. It says closure is simple, closure is all purpose, and closure is fun. And, and of course, it seems very reasonable to assume that therefore, because it is simple and because it's all purpose and because it's fun, it must be uh, great for beginners. And I don't think that's true. And in particular, I don't think that's true because these issues are beside the point. Um, and I'll try to explain why that is. And also, they're not necessarily true, right? Um, I mean, is closure really simple? So here's a closure program, right? Compiles just fine. Um, see the mistake? Right? Uh, so this is a natural mistake that beginners will make, right? You can immediately see why. And you can also see that the programming language could be slightly different in such a way to make that mistake not happen. Um, but 
uh, well, there you go, right? There's also other minor issues, I think, which we could paper over, but if you look at this, um, well, it says, you know, it says empty P there in the first test that you have, but then it says not empty without a P there, and why is that? Right? We all know, as programmers, as professional programmers, we can figure out why that is, right? and it helps us in our capacity as professional programmers, but that really reflects the fact that Clojure is a programming language you know, designed mostly by one professional programmer, and it's very successful for other professional programmers, but students are not professional programmers, not yet. So um, also, well, you all know this, right? You Whatever, you know, I just picked an arbitrary error message that you get out of the system. And of course, successful teaching also doesn't, doesn't just mean, you know, you tell people and they say, oh, I understand all this, but it also means enabling them to write code um, on their own. And Clojure doesn't make that exactly easy um, because of this particular aspect. So um, um, there's another aspect, I think, which, is, uh, which could be fixed. Um, I took something else off the Closure Bridge homepage. And if you look at, so there's various pages on the didactic approach that they take. Um, and if you look at them, you will find that um, they, they follow an approach that I call teaching by example. So for example, here's an introduction to higher order function. And it says, well, here's the map function. Here's a bunch of examples on how to call that function. Um, and there's this implicit assumption there that if you just, if we just give enough great examples to our students, that then they will figure out somehow how to actually write programs um, on their own. And I don't think that's true for um, many students, at least if you have like a large cross-section of the population among your students. So there's various things that make it difficult for beginners to really be successful at learning how to program in the sense that they um, uh, that, that they learn to write a successful program on their own, right? There's this didactic issue, which I just mentioned. There's the programming language, and I, you know, we all think that some programming languages make it harder than others to learn. Um, there's the IDE issue, um, and I'm looking very much forward to the next talk, which uh, hopefully is going to make uh, uh, some advances in that area for, for closure. Um, I'm not going to talk much about how people learn in general, which is uh, by extended practice directed at, um, at getting feedback and, and improving. Um, so not that much time. So my points of reference is uh, I, I got very much influenced by Matthias Felleisen's group, um, uh, who's, one, who's one of the co-authors of a, a very, very good book called, called How to Design Programs, um, which just went into its second edition. One of the great things about it is that you can get an online edition for free. Um, and uh, so this is a book that's designed for teaching the intro course at the, uh, at the university level. Uh, we did sort of a companion piece to that or a similar book for our intro course uh, a number of years back, years back at the University of Tübingen, which is this book, which I don't recommend, however, because it's very um, expensive and by now outdated, but there is a free version of most of the parts of that book on a site called Dein Programm, and that's in German. So, and that's sometimes helpful for some of your students. So, um, Really, I want to ask you a couple of questions, right? What is, you know, when you teach somebody how to program, right? And I'll come back to some of those questions. You know, what, what is the thing that you really want to teach, right? How, what is important to you, right? And some, some things might be important to you that are not important to others. That's completely leg legitimate. So I'll tell you what's important to me is that students learn how to program in what I call a systematic fashion. So, which is very different from giving somebody a, like a little Arduino or whatever, a robot and saying, you'll go play. Um, I want people to be successful at constructing programs in, in, in a systematic way so as to enable them to actually be successful at constructing programs that work, that do something um, that the students want to do. So the approach pioneered by that book I showed you earlier about how to design programs is something called design recipes. In Germany, we call it Konstruktionsanleitung. And if you were here two years ago, I gave a talk um, on sort of the basic underlying approach for construction, but it is primarily an approach to teaching. So I'll run through a classic example for design recipes and for functional programming. Uh, so Matthias Felleisen, when he developed this, he was teaching in Texas. So here's a Texas highway. And on the Texas highway, there are various animals. In particular, we'll focus on two kinds of animals. We'll focus on armadillos and rattlesnakes. Okay? So, um, and so this approach, how to design program, focuses on data-driven programming. So it really, uh, we start out modeling data. 
So we think about armadillos, and armadillos, for the sake of this little exercise that we're doing, they have two properties. They're either alive or dead, because, well, we'll see what happens to them on the Texas highway, and they have a certain weight. Uh, this, you could call this domain-driven design, I learned recently. Um, so anyway, so this is something called compound data, and you can recognize it by saying, you know, as something, it has several properties or it consists of several other parts. And that's pretty easy, so that's eminently teachable um, just to, for students to look at the wording that they use to describe data. Um, you can call it an aggregation. I don't, I don't particularly care, but it is one of the fundamental construction principles of, of, um, um, of data. So this didactic approach, just to interject that here, it comes with specifically designed programming languages. They are specifically designed for uh, teaching and for learning. And you can see that they don't look so alien even to closure programmers. Um, uh, and it comes with its own IDE, which has been specifically designed for teaching and for learning. And that IDE is called uh, Dr. Racket. So um, in particular, you can see here a snippet of code that says, well, an armadillo, it's either dead or alive, and it has a weight. So it has these several properties. So um, that's something you can type into a program as a comment. And so something we call a data definition. And you can then translate it via a fairly mechanical process into a piece of code. That is important that it's mechanical in the sense that everybody can do it. So in the case of uh, the teaching languages that we use, uh, you use a construct. It looks awkward to you. It wasn't designed for you. It was designed for beginners, called define record procedures, where you define a record, uh, called Dillo, yeah, not type too much. There's a constructor called make Dillo. Um, there's a predicate called Dillo P. And then there's two selectors for the two fields in an armadillo uh, object called Dillo alive and Dillo wait. So, um, well, there's, so you see various comments that say what these things are. You can immediately use that to construct examples, so that's not very exciting for closure programmers. So make Dillo is that constructor. You can pass it, you know, true and 10, which says, well, the armadillo is alive. Alive is true and it weighs 10 kilos. And there's another armadillo which is dead, slightly heavier. Um, the comment here establishes a connection between the information um, represented by the object and the object itself. So these are all things which follow from these design recipes. So there's a recipe that says somewhere, well, you write a data definition, and you write code that corresponds to that data definition, and you write a bunch of examples, and you, for each example, you write a little comment that says what the connection is to the information out in the world. So this is a very strict and pedantic and bureaucratic approach to teaching programming. Um, and, and not enough. Um, so our teaching languages have something called signatures, um, where you just declare for a function, for example, the constructor. Well, the constructor, we remember an armadillo is this thing that has two fields. One is a Boolean, one has a number. So the constructor takes a Boolean and a number and it produces a Dillo object. And conversely, the selectors um, um, take, that, take that field out. So they both take a Dillo object and they return a Boolean and a number respectively. We make students write this down. Right? Um, even though you might think that you know, the second two are kind of redundant with the first. Actually, the students made me make them write it down at some point in the early, uh, in the late 90s. Um, so, well, so what happens on the Texas highway, well, it says life on the Texas highway is these, you know, the armadillos, they get run over by cars, right? So, um, um, so well, I don't have to explain functional programming to you. So we are going to write a function called run over Dillo. And it takes a Dillo object, which is not really representing an armadillo, but representing the state of the armadillo at a certain time, if you think about it, uh, and returns the state of the armadillo after it's been run over. Right? So there's up there, you see a signature. It might remind you of something in Clojure, which we've had for many more years, though. Um, and you write test cases. And you will notice that the test cases are you know, part of the same program. Um, you know, that says, well, we should expect when we run over that armadillo D1 that it still weighs 10 kilos, but it's dead afterwards. And if we run, you know, D2 presumably has been run over already. If you run over it again, it's still dead and still weighs 12 kilos. Um, once you've written that, you write what we, well, in German, we call it the skeleton um, down there. From the signature up there follows a little piece of program. Um, and that little piece of program, in particular, has three dots in there. That doesn't mean you don't write it down. Students, they type three dots in their special language support for those three dots that say your program is not finished yet. Um, 
So um, anyway, uh, so. Uh, but the signature actually tells you more things. It says, well, this Dillo thing, remember, we had that definition that said it's compound data, right? Now, with compound data, if you want to do something sensible with compound data, you really need to look at the contents. So compound data goes in. That means you should probably call the selectors, probably, right? Um, and so you might as well call, write down the calls to the selectors just from the signature. You're not thinking about what is actually happening in that function yet. And also, compound data comes out. If you want to have co compound data come out, uh, well, you need to call the constructor. So you can write that down, too. And all those little three dots, people, we ask people to type them in. So these are the building blocks for the function that you're creating. right? And now you see them in front of you, and that makes it easier for beginners to um, then figure out what to do with them. So and then you, um, uh, well, there's a couple of intermediate steps there, but you fairly easily arrive at the, at the final solution. One part of that solution is that you actually think for like one second, oh, it doesn't really matter that the Dillo was alive before, and so I can elide the call to the, um, to the corresponding selector. And so, and, but that, happens, that then happens as a conscious act, and that's valuable. So um, anyway, so we said armadillos. There's also rattlesnakes, so I'm just going to, well, you no, know, rattlesnake has the following properties, maybe thickness and length. But you can immediately see that it goes through the exact same motions that we went with the, um, uh, with the armadillos. Uh, again, we write a corresponding function that runs over rattlesnake. Um, I mainly introduce rattlesnakes because now you can think that the Texas Highway has both. You know, it has mixed together armadillos and rattlesnakes. And that um, uh, pay, paves the way for... Uh, another construct, which says, well, if you have wording like, the like this, which says an animal is one of the following, or it's this, or that, or that, or that, that is not compound data. That's a different uh, means of data construction, and it's something called mixed data. Again, you know, whatever, the strongly typed people, they will call it a sum type or something like that, or the discriminated union. It doesn't really matter. We call it mixed data. Um, and you know, once, you, once you've identified your mixed data and written a sentence like this, you can translate it into code directly. And our teaching language has, well, you remember, it had some, this thing called signature. It says, well, an animal, you know, it's either that rattlesnake or an armadillo, and really an animal that's mixed from armadillos and rattlesnakes right there. Making sense so far? Going through it pretty quickly because you all know closure. Okay, and so... As before, right? we can now write a function that doesn't just work over armadillos or over, um, uh, or over rattlesnakes. We write a function called run over animal. It goes from animal to animal. We can sort of reuse the test cases that we had before. And now again, because we're looking at a signature, and that signature now has data going in that is mixed data, right? we can immediately deduce something that should be in the body of our function. Right? Because we can't really do anything specific with mixed data until we know which one it is. And so we might as well write a cond um, that distinguishes between the armadillos and the rattlesnakes, again, without specifically knowing what that function is going to do. So that enables students to finish large parts of their program. Uh, so I don't know if you've dealt with German students specifically. You know, they, they tend to want to think through the entire problem, and if they don't, if they don't see that they're going to get to the end, they are not going to write the first thing on the piece of paper or in the program, and so that gets them going to almost the end. At which point they discover that um, you know the last step is not that hard. And so, well, we've already written those functions that uh, run over an armadillo and a rattlesnake. We just need to re reuse them. To professional programmers, and I've, I've left out like half the steps that occur as part of this, uh, of this teaching method, you know. And you look at this, and you know, when you look at this book, I mean, even more the, the American book, um, uh, pr um, which is on how to, which is how to design programs, it will seem unbelievably pedantic and bureaucratic to you, right? Bureaucracy was invented in Germany. Matthias Felleisen is originally from Germany. So you go, you get this face, right? Um, it is, I, it, it, will, it will not be inspiring, I can tell you that right now, until you actually use it in teaching extensively when kind of your, some, your kind of it morphs into, your face eventually will morph into this. You're not going to believe me, but maybe a couple more talks this way and some experiments will convince you of that. 
Let me give you, so it's this very bureaucratic approach, but there's various things that support that bureaucratic approach. You've seen the programming language, and it looks close to closure, um, and it looks close to uh, the racket, original racket language built into the Dr. Racket system, which originates from Scheme, but it is not the same, and it contains quite a few elements and changes from those languages to support beginners. I mentioned that Dr. Racket is an IDE that specifically supports beginners. So for example, if you write a signature like this and your program violates one of those signatures, you get a pretty specific error message. That error message will contain links to the places in the program. It will tell you, you know, here, you know, you call something with an invalid argument. It will tell you what value violated what signature and uh, what expression did that. Um, and that makes, it, um, that makes it easier for students to then fix mistakes because well, as you all know, program construction is not just about writing it down and then you're finished. You know, if something goes wrong, you would like to enable students um, to fix the problems by themselves. Um, there's also various specific error messages um, that deviate from what the professional racket uh, does uh, to help beginners. And, um, and you can see IDE support that will actually point you at the location of the error, stuff like that. Um, a minor point, I'm not going to talk about that much, is that, um, uh, so we discovered that the output that comes out of the, the racket REPL, and for your intents and purposes, you can imagine the closure output is often confusing for beginners, right? We think homo iconicity, I learned, Paul taught me yesterday how to pronounce this word. Um, homo iconicity, I gotta say that again, is we all know how great it is, right? But it is very confusing for beginners to see sort of this notational, uh, overlap between the output of your program and the program itself. And so we found that it helps beginners to distinguish that output. And so our programming, our teaching languages, they, for example, when they print a list, they don't just put round parentheses around everything, but it really says, you know, hash list, and that, um, uh, that tends to reduce the, uh, the mental overhead that you need. Another aspect, so especially if you are dealing with students who, uh, who, grew, who learned an imperative language previously, did you notice that they, they kind of ask you, how do I change the value of that variable at some point? A lot of them, right? So if you leave them to their own devices, you know, they, these kids today, they know the internet, they can figure this out, right? Um, so um, how to, you know, and they'll figure out how to do assignments and closure as well. Um, and in particular, so one of the uh, one of the charms of the programming languages uh, that, that we, we've designed for teaching is that they remove certain features, um, so um, which has two effects. First of all, students won't get tempted to use them, and the other one is also that they won't get error messages that refer to programming languages feature programming language features which they have not seen yet, right? Which happens if you watch out for it. You don't usually notice it if you, but if you watch out for it, you'll notice that that happens quite frequently. Um, so I, I hope you can read it. So there's a German language error message that says, uh, says something here. Um, so, so, the, um, and, and, and so one of the things, I'm not gonna go over that again, but oh, over that at all, is that we don't just have specific programming languages, there's an entire hierarchy of them. So we have four different ones that go from beginner to advanced, and they will introduce new features. The last one, for example, then also introduces the homo iconic uh, output. Um, at which point students are ready for it, right? So um, this has been a very long process, and we've benefited greatly from, uh, from Matthias's group uh, and their work, which went on, on over many years. So the older ones among you will remember that Scheme was actually quite popular as a scheme. So the Scheme programming language was actually pr quite popular as a teaching language because it was used at MIT as part of a very famous book. Um, and... Um, so a lot of people adopted that one and found out that it doesn't work. Um, so they thought it doesn't work for them, but it turned out it doesn't really work at MIT either. Even though Scheme has the same properties that, you know, closure were listed for closure in the beginning, and even more so in some sense. So the language is even simpler. Um, so, so we all, Matthias and I, we all started out with this belief because Scheme is this wonderful language and it's, it's so simple um, and it's so highly structured, it should be great teaching language. And it was a very painful realization for us that um, we needed to at least change it um, to make it more palatable for beginners. So, um, you know, so, so in some sense, the, the, the starting point of Scheme was arbitrary because the people involved were all schemers. Um, 
but it took many, many years to then refine those programming languages and design those te teaching languages to the point uh, where they're pretty good tools for beginners. Many, many years. So Matthias started uh, sometime in the mid-90s, um, I think with this, um, probably earlier in, in his head. Um, and well, you could see how long I've been at it. And it took me until the end of the 90s, or I think the early 2000s, until I even re realized that that is something that I needed to work on. So anyway, the end result of that is something called, these days it's called Program by Design. So there's a website that gives you information on that. Um, and also links to that book. Um, the, the, the German thing that we run with, unfortunately, slightly less energy and resources called Dein Programm, um, which has that online book. We have you know, specific, special um, uh, languages that are built into Dr. Racket. Um, so, but three things come together. There's this pedagogic approach, uh, which are the design recipes, which I showed you, programming languages designed for beginners, for, uh, for learners specifically, and a programming environment also designed for learners. So, um, and these, they're not perfect and they're still getting improved, um, but they are, you know, far advanced beyond anything else um, that follows, that tries to achieve these goals. So I want to ask you a couple of, so I want to, want you to send, want to send you home with few, a few questions, right? Um, if, I mean, if you're excited about teaching something to somebody, right, why, why do you think that is important, right? So is teaching closure something, and, and in and of itself, or is it, you know, is it some larger goal? You know, you think software is important. Um, you want to, whatever, you want to create future software engineers. You think that programming should be part of the general education. I don't know. Your, you know, your personal answer might vary, but it should shape what you teach. You know, why? You know, is functional programming? Is that, again, if you want to teach that, is that, is there something intrinsically important in teaching that, or? is that in, in, in and of itself, and the same thing is about programming, right? There are many initiatives these days that say, well, you know, we need to teach our kids how to program, it doesn't, but, but then you find out it, they don't consider it really important how that happens, right? You know, as long, you know, as long as there's some something, something programming in the curriculum, but ever notice how much crap software there is? So is, is, is the end result of that, is that going to be an improvement over that? Um, and so I think, if you think about those things, I, that would make me very happy. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Should I pull? Yes, that's a good idea. I'll bring you the mic. <laughs> So uh, thanks for the talk. First of all, I want to say that I learned about these things after like years of uh, professional experience in mm -hmm. programming and I still enjoyed it a lot and mm -hmm. I think it's definitely worth looking into that if you think it might be interesting. Um, what I wonder though, do you have an idea or thoughts on how much like using design recipes like that um, are applicable for professional or more experienced programmers and if not, like, do you have ideas on how they transition from, you know, learning with these recipes to writing um, programming in a more loosely way? I, so I've not seen any problems with that. So a lot of the people who work for me are my former students. Um, and they seem to do just fine. <laughs> um, if, you know, but, but, but something that I often want to ask them to do is to stick closer to what they've learned. So this... This is perfectly, this, I mean, this is a perfect method for developing software professionally, right? It's one that you don't see very often, but that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be applied more. Does that make sense? Um, maybe another data point which is interesting is that, um, so since, since uh, I entered professional life, uh, we've done quite a bit of training, and I always thought that, you know, professional programmers, they know Eclipse or whatever it is, and so if they ask for closure or Scala training, the thing to do is just use the same didactic approach with, just with those languages because they don't, well, they hopefully won't have that much trouble um, with the problems that beginners have trouble with. And I found that uh, it works okay, but it works even better if you do this first. So if we offer like a three-day closure training, if the customer is willing, we do two days of that and one day of closure. Um, and, that then, and, and we go through it very, very quickly and that seems to work better than if we do closure the whole way. Hey, great talk. Um, 
So what you're showing seems to be, for me at least, a little more advanced. What mm -hmm. age group are you dealing with? I mean, it sounds like uh, a higher higher level of education. Um, so, mm -hmm. I'm, so I guess two questions, like what age group would you mm -hmm. use this method on and why, why are you teaching that age group to program? So it's just an artifact of my professional history that most of my experience has been with uh, university students and professional programmers. Um, so the, this program by design thing that has branched out into high school. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, actually a very large project in the United States called Bootstrap, which you will find if linked from that page. Which, um, w so this is very successful for high school students as well. Um, I think they mostly do it from age 11 on, right? But they do the same thing. Right? They have slightly different, they don't, I mean, they don't go through that very thick and intimidating book. They have online material, they have slightly different material, but they take that same approach. Um, so, of course, I want to tell you about like my children and my godchildren that I'm teaching, but you know, there, there's like a single digit number of them, so that experience might not, might not be statistically relevant. Um, so, um, but yeah, so that works. I think, I think I can with confidence say that it works from age 11 or 12 on up. Uh, so I, I participated once in uh, Closure Bridge, mm -hmm. and we used like the analogy of uh, recipes and combining mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. But I find it inter interesting restricting the features of cl Closure, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. yeah. But I wouldn't know where to start restricting them. So is there any kind of guide already available that we could use to teach people, like? This first. So, so you're, you're, you're not going to like my suggestion. Okay. My, my suggestion is <laughs> to not, not bother. I think that, yeah. that work on, I, I, I tried, I, tr I, I played around with Maria a little bit last night, and that looks like very worthwhile uh, work. But if you start teaching how to program, even as part of Closure Bridge, just use this, okay. right? And then switch to Closure at some point. And that's going to save you all of that. And that works fine. Okay. And that's going to save you all of that work. Um. Uh, could you like elaborate a little bit on uh, the limitations of teaching by example? I mean, teaching by example seems to be such a natural choice and some people might demand it. What kind of arguments would you come up with? Well, let's take a different path than doing it by example. My experience is just that it does not work, right, for a lot of students. Um, so, I mean, it's not that we don't have examples. I mean, sure, we do have examples. But the important thing about this didactic approach is that every single method is taught explicitly and has a name, right, so that you can refer to it. Um, and just my experience is that, you, I, I mean, I can't even, it, and to me, it doesn't even seem natural, but that might mean that I'm, I've just been captured by this and, and, and have been uh, teaching using this for too long. Yeah, um, do you but, have a reasoning for people to tell them why it does not work? Besides saying, well, you present people a bunch of code, but you don't explain to them how it was constructed, right? And I, so there's a big question mark in the, you know, between you, say, you know, showing you this piece of code and them being able to write a piece of code like that by themselves. So, um, I mean, it's easy, right, for a teacher. You just do great examples, but um, it's, it, my experience it doesn't work for many students. One last question. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I have to admit, I learned Scheme in uh, in university. It took me two months to love it, but I did eventually. Uh, my question is uh, something else, though. So what do you find is um, most different and most difficult, probably, about uh, teaching people that think they already know programming? It's primarily to convince them to go through this. After that, it's fine, right? Especially if you go through this at a quick pace, people generally don't have time to remember what they already know. So, I, I, so, so, so my experience has been once you get started with this, people are fine, right? Uh, but I usually have to like convince a purchasing department or the manager or something like that who really want like Scala training or, or closure training or something like this to let me to only do like only spend a small part of the training on the actual closure um, and start with this. But once you get that, so that's the hardest problem is convincing the manager. Okay, so getting them out of their comfort zone yeah. first. Yeah. Oh, soccer terms. Very good. Yeah.
Well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>